Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, famed physicist Lawrence Krauss joins us for a look at the latest in science news, including a comet that flew too close to the sun and the possibility of an ancient lake on Mars. Science Talk with Lawrence Krauss next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Every month, world-renowned physicist Lawrence Krauss joins us for the latest in science news. And tonight we'll hear about dying comets, lakes on Mars, and new DNA evidence that shakes up the human family tree. Here now to explain it all is Lawrence Krauss. Good to see you again. It's good to be back in this holiday season. Yes, and it's good to have you for the entire show. Now we're not going to rush you out of here yeah. so that uh, the great mysteries of the universe aren't being compromised. And we have a blackboard for the equations. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go right ahead. Uh, uh, let's start with this ice on comet because we, we were so excited and we couldn't wait to see it go around the sun and come back. It went around the sun. What happened? Well, you know, comets, are. it's hard to predict what's going to happen. I mean, how many times have you been disappointed by comets in the last decade? You know, everyone says, it's going to be great, it's going to be great. And we don't know. Uh, it's one of those things that, that it was very bright when it was far away from the sun, and that's what gave people a lot of hope that, that it, would, uh, it might give some wonderful fireworks as it came around the sun and, and passed by the Earth. It was actually, interestingly enough, it was one of the observations that's headed by a group at ASU of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that, that turned its cameras towards its high-res cameras towards the uh, comet when it flew by Mars and, and saw that it was less than a half a mile across. And that meant it was pretty small. And, uh, and, then, the, it was, and then it was going to go very, very close to the sun. And a whole slew of, of, and you're seeing pictures now, a whole slew of different NASA instruments uh, imaged the comet. And uh, everyone was waiting with bated breath to see what would happen when this comet came close to the sun and came around. And of course, what happened is it sort of disappeared and, and ended with a whimper rather than a bang. And the point is it was a small comet. It was very close to the sun. And it's probably comets that are too small basically don't have enough self-gravity and, and, and to hold them uh, together under the heat of the sun and with the large gravitational field and the heat. And this one basically broke apart. So it died and then, and then everyone said, oh, and then it came around the other side and you could sort of see it again. And people thought, oh, maybe, maybe just somehow mysteriously disappeared. But that was just probably the pieces that had been yeah. broken up. And, it, and so it, it, it broke up. Now, that's a disappointment if you like to see, you know, things under the night sky here on Earth. And comets are always spectacular to see. With, the big comets are amazing in the night sky. But it's not so disappointing for scientists because as it breaks up, and there were so many, this comet has been studied by more instruments than any other comet in history. And... So many instruments were focused on it as it was breaking up and shining under the, on the sun that we can learn a lot about what its composition is. And, and since comets are really messengers of the beginning of our solar system, they, this comet came from the Oort cloud, which is about four and a half trillion miles away from the sun. And it was formed when the solar system formed. So this snowball contains the primordial water, the primordial stuff, the same stuff that seeded the Earth. And so if we can see the light it emits when it, before it died around the sun, we'll be able to learn the materials that, that, that came from it and, and its composition and learn about the primordial stuff that may have seeded life on Earth and maybe Mars, as we'll talk about later. But that's what kind of gets you, you a little bit here. This thing was, what, four some odd billion years old. Uh, the the and it goes to our, and it's gone. Well, you know, you fly too close to the sun and you're gone. That's happened since the Greek myths. But isn't that, isn't it, I mean, isn't that something, it, it's, it's a little sobering to think about something that old, gone. Gone. Just think of when the Earth goes in five, another five billion years, we'll be 10 billion years old and we'll be gone. A lot of, I mean, most comets miss the sun, but every now and this one, I mean, some of them go right into it. Remember the, the, the comets that hit, the, that hit uh, Jupiter, right? They didn't get absorbed. In fact, fortunately for us, most comets hit Jupiter because that's what made it so big early on, and otherwise they would have hit the Earth uh, eventually. And Jupiter ate them up, which is why it's a thousand times the mass of the Earth. So it, it's, a, it's actually, for astronomers, it's actually fascinating to watch the death of something like that because you learn a tremendous amount about it. Now, wow, yeah, it's, it's not too happy for, for well, yeah, the comet didn't care. The com <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. So basically, this thing has been in orbit 
doing something for 4.5 billion years? Yeah, it's on the outer, there's a huge amount of material in the outer part of the solar system, some of which was there as the solar system collapsed, other of which was, was sort of shot out by Jupiter because it's, as it grew, its gravitational field perturbed things and sometimes it kicks them out and sometimes it kicked them, kicks them in. So these, there's a tremendous number of objects out in this Oort cloud that are orbiting around and have been around since the beginning of the solar system just like the planets orbit the sun, they orbit the sun. And what happens is, for reasons that we're not 100% certain of, some gravitational perturbation, a star comes nearby or something, and just gives enough extra gravity to change the orbit and cause it to head towards the sun, and then it's a comet. And, uh, and those ancient snowballs sometimes head towards the sun, but more importantly, as I think we talked about in an earlier program, some of them hit the Earth, and we think there's enough comets hit the Earth, and they're large snowballs, over its history to have produced all the water in the Earth's ocean. So, so they're very important. They may, and, and, and because they're organic materials on comets, they may have seeded the Earth yes. and potentially other planets with the raw materials necessary to create life. So they're, they're incredibly interesting. Oh, I just 4.5 billion years, and just it's like that, time. you go into Thanksgiving in 2013, and you're over with your history. You're gone. You know everything. Uh, you know it, it, at least it went out with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is it is the is Ison dead? It's dead. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, you know it, a week ago the probability was 90 percent, but I was just looking at the NASA website, and they said it's gone. It broke apart. So it's not hiding in the dust up there. Not yeah. hiding behind and a it, flare. And what we saw was probably the dust that was emitted as it broke okay. up. Okay. And and. Uh, so it's gone, and uh, we'll have to wait for the next one. All right. Um, what's this business about the possibility of an ancient lake on Mars? Well, it, and it's perfect. It's perfect segue from the comet because it was probably created with a large impact. In fact, it was created with a large impact. It's in a crater. The impact was about four billion years ago or so. And what's and and of course NASA knew that might be a good site. For lake beds. It had already looked at other, other places and, and the other rovers that discovered places on, on Mars that they thought there was liquid water in. And in fact, uh, uh, I think it was Opportunity that found uh, a spot. And then it turned out it was really more sulfuric acid than water. And, but this looked like, because it looked like from, from the sky, we were able to see from, from spectroscopic measurements, it looked like there was clay. Now, clay forms at a lake bed. So, this, so that's why the, the, this rover um, went down uh, and and uh, and landed in that crater to 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 look at that lake bed. And what's what's been discovered is, in fact, well, it was discovered a while ago that on the surface, uh, if you looked at the materials, it looked just like the materials you might see here in Arizona at, uh, by a stream. The materials are sort of weathered by water, and and it looked just like water, liquid water, had flowed. The the there's clay been now directly measured there, and now it's become clear. As, as, as the rover actually drilled down into uh, it, about five centimeters into the, into the Martian rock, that, uh, that it not only is clay, but it looks like from all the chemicals that are there, that in fact it was a lake bed. All the, all the rock structures are just like, the, just like a lake bed here on Earth. But it also what's interesting is it has materials like carbon and oxygen and phosphorus that, that suggest there may have been organic materials there. Now, from measuring this, you can suggest that the lake bed was, was maybe pretty large and, may, and, according to NASA, it would have existed for at least 10 or 100,000 years. That may sound like a long time, but from the point of view of the evolution of life, it's not so long. But that's at least. Some people argue it could have existed for millions of years or tens of millions of years. It wasn't that. It was fairly shallow lake bed. And what's also clear is that Mars, even though in the early history of Mars, in the first billion years or so, this remember, this lake bed was created about four billion years ago, uh, when Mars was about a billion years old. Mars was much hotter and wetter than it is now. But from looking at the material that was, was sort of brought into the lake bed by water, streaming water, that material didn't get, other, uh, didn't get weathered like it normally would have. That, suggest, that suggests that outside the lake bed, it was actually still pretty cold and arid. So this might have been a frozen lake bed, hmm. and which you know, periodically thawed. So Mars was hotter and wetter than it is now, but it wasn't, it wasn't a Shangri-La. It, and it looks like it, outside of that lake bed, it was still pretty cold. So there's a lot of interesting questions. What, what I was just reading, which is interesting, is that 
the, and, and this is preliminary, but they, they heated up this material because there's, there's evidence of carbon, which of course is the basis of organic molecules. The question is, is it due to organic molecules or is it due to carbon dioxide? Okay. And a recent test heating it up suggests that it might be due to organic materials. So you have water and organic materials. That gets people excited. Now, where do the organic materials come from? Could they have come from life? Or, and it comes back to the comet, yeah, I said, yeah. could they have come from the comets? And the answer is we don't know. But it, it, if you look at the amount of organic material that comets have bombarded, at the upper level, the level of carbon that's measured there could have come from the comets within a factor of two. Or it could have come from organic material. So they're going to actually, there have been some proposals for ways to actually look for these organic materials directly in this lake bed. Okay. It's, a, it's an open question. I have to say... I'm a little pessimistic because, you know, water, organic materials sounds great. But if you look where life first formed on Earth, it was probably deep in the ocean vents because you need more than just water and organic materials. You need a source of energy. Life requires energy to, to, to operate. And there's some weird uh, chemolithophiles here on Earth that there's some weird organisms that exist a mile underground that actually use the, the, the different elements in the rock as power. But it's, that's, pretty hard, that, that, that's probably pretty hard to do. The, the simplest that way for life to have developed was where there was a lot of energy and a lot of power. And the lake bed in the deep ocean vents where these hot, rich or materials coming out with lots of, lots of hydrogen, that was a good place for life to start. And if this was a lake bed, there'd be water, but there wouldn't be that source of energy. So, but, <laughs> one last bit. The lake was around about 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago, somewhere in that range. After the after the the impact meteor impacted and caused the crater, and that's just around the time that life evolved on Earth. The oldest fossils on Earth are about 3.5 to 4 billion years old. So here is a liquid environment existing at the same time as life was evolving on Earth, and that gets people excited. From my point of view, the greatest likelihood of finding life in that in that or a, not existing life, but extinct evidence of of organic materials from life, might be. If the, if the microbes on Earth that were forming then were knocked out of Earth by some impact and, and landed on Mars. Because I think I've told you before, we get rocks from Mars all the time, and a little bit more rarely, Mars gets rocks from Earth from impacts, and there were many more, many more impacts occurring in the first billion years of soil life on Earth. So maybe the Earth polluted Mars, and that was an environment where the microbes are survived. We'll see. It's an open question, and it's exciting as a big if, but uh, we should, we might be as disappointed by it as we were about uh, the, the comet ice. Well, I, this is all very fascinating, but one last question on this before we move okay. on. Okay, so comet perhaps hits Mars, lake is formed, bucolic for 100,000, whatever thousands yeah. of years. What happened to the lake? Where'd it go? What happened? Oh, well, it, well I mean, Mars, it, Mars got cold and the water from the surface, because Mars is smaller than the Earth, evaporates. Okay, so it basically... Or, you know, I mean, there's some water that, of course, seeps down, and, and there is evidence of water underneath the Martian soil. So there's, there's, there's definitely water on Mars, but, but any large lake beds w would disappear, and, and yeah. Mars is just too far and a little smaller than Earth, so it can't hold on to his, what are called volatiles, because, after all, water is a volatile. It evaporates in the atmosphere. So no real aquifer, no real cloud. It just kind of... Well, not Who, now, but um, you know, at, at four billion point. years ago, okay. there probably there could have been, and and you know, it, it, and we don't know. Uh, it's all could have right now, but that's why we send these things there to learn. Yeah. And maybe one day I'll come on the program and say, guess what? A little creepy crawly thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I wouldn't well, hold your breath. But uh, we'll as see. long as we get to interview the creepy crawly, yeah, that's yeah. all I care about. All right. Um, new DNA throwing a lot of people for a loop here because now there could be yet another pre-human human. What's going on? Well, I, it's, it's uh, we, you know, this follows on the last, I think, the last program we had. We're, we're discovering a lot about our lineage all the time. And, and as I said on the last program, you know, we're, we're working on little, little tidbits. As, as, as the example I used was that if, I, if, if you found, if, if archaeologists uh, 500 million years from now discovered the remains of a, of a of a basketball player from, from Arizona and me, they might say we're two different species because we, unless we happen to be in the same cave or the same house or whatever when we, when we got hit by an asteroid or a comet, who knows? Sure. But, and so it's really hard to make general, generalizations if you're working with sparse data. But, but we're getting more and more data all the time. Now, what's interesting about this particular new 
observation is it throws things up again and, and, and it, it, it flies in the face of conventional wisdom. So a group in Germany about a little over a decade ago actually began to be able, it's almost like um, Jurassic Park, they actually began to be able to drill into the bones of, of fossilized remains of hominids and extract DNA and begin to build up uh, uh, an impression of what the DNA of these, of these ancient hominids were. And in fact, the, the, essentially, the, almost the entire genome of a Neanderthals has been sequenced. Okay? Now, what was discovered in a cave in Siberia from about 50 to 80,000 years ago what was some DNA from a finger of a young girl at the time. And it didn't seem at all like the DNA of the, of the Neanderthals. And it was, it, I think it was in Denisova, uh, a place in Siberia. And so these, these, these beings were called Denisovans. And they thought that probably what happened is that they were connected to the common ancestor that connected them to humans, just like Neanderthals are our cousins and were connected by a common ancestor early on, that the Denisovans had been, you know, were another recent species, okay, separate. Um, now, the problem is a new... In a, in a cave in Spain, a new, the oldest DNA that's ever been recovered, 400,000 years old. But it's in Spain, not in Siberia. It was felt that the Denisovans went over to Siberia and the Neanderthals weren't, and that's how they sort of they diverged from their common ancestor because when species are separated, that's how they evolve and diverge. So the Denisovans were way, way over there and the Neanderthals were in Europe and the, hom the Homo sapiens were in Africa and eventually the Homo sapiens left Africa and all the other guys died out, maybe we killed them, and, we, and, and they went extinct. But here in Spain, where the Neanderthal is supposed to be, is a 400,000-year-old bit of DNA, and when it's sequenced, it looks like the Denisovans. Does it look a lot like the Denisovans? It looks a lot like, more like the Denisovans than the Neanderthals. So the question is, what gives here? And, and there's lots of possibilities. One possibility is that, well, there was, there was DNA in, the early, in an earlier common ancestor, there was a lot of Denisovan-like DNA that died out in the, that stayed with the Denisovans and died out in the Neanderthals. Okay. And so maybe, so maybe there was a common ancestor, or maybe it's a new species that looks a lot like the Denisovans that aren't common ancestor of them, or maybe we all share that that DNA. And, and but it, it just it indicates that the wis the conventional wisdom that there's somehow the idea that the Neanderthals and Denisovans separated a while ago and th that their DNA is distinct clearly is not right because this in this cave and it's amazing that you can do this I mean for, you have to worry a lot about when you're looking at ancient DNA because bacteria and other things get in those and you're so you've got to make sure you're not being contaminated by, oh, by yeah. and they've been able to do that very well uh, in, 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 in Germany and, and and so this seems pretty definitive and it's a fascinating result and it means our ancestry is more complicated and interesting than we thought. It doesn't, I want to stress, it doesn't mean, I mean, we're always at the edge of our knowledge, and it doesn't suggest that we don't have a common ancestor with these people. It does. All of that works out. Evolution happened. We have these beings as our common ancestors, just as we have worms as our common ancestors a lot longer ago. But it means the details are being worked out, and, and, and refining things and being wrong is what science is all about, in a sense, because we learn new things. And, and so, We'll just keep trying. So we don't know if this is a separate species. We don't know if these are all just kissing cousins here, these Neanderthals. Well, they were the kissing cousins. One thing we do know is we're all kissing cousins. There's real evidence that Homo sapiens, Denisovans, and Neanderthals interbred. Okay. So, you know, when I was a kid, and I'm not a biologist, but I remember saying, well, species are, are things that can't, you know, that, that are separated. They can't breed and produce viable offspring. That's not true anymore. That's not the definition of species. It's much more complicated because of DNA measurement. So humans did interbreed with Neanderthals and Denisovans, and maybe that explains it all. Maybe there was a lot of interesting intrigue going on back then. <laughs> yes, I'm sure there was. Probably a soap opera made uh, as the hominid turns. Uh, all right, uh, before we go now, mm -hmm. we got uh, the Higgs is, 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 is still well, today, every... Well, we got to talk about it because today is December 10th. You know what happens on December 10th? The Nobel Prize comes out. You, uh, it's given. It's it, it comes. It's a war. It's announced earlier, but December 10th is. And I was there a few bunch of years ago. Is the big the, the it, It's handed out. There's a big party afterwards. It's an amazing event. And today the Nobel Prize is given to Francois Anglaire and Peter Higgs for the proposal of the Higgs, one of the greatest part of the greatest human intellectual edifice that's ever been created, the standard model of particle physics. And so we're celebrating that today with the Nobel Prize, so I thought we should at least talk about it. And 
And uh, we're and what's great, and I thought it would be good to, you know, it it the standard model is a much more well-defined theory than, say, our understanding of our human ancestor right now. It, it, it every experiment that's been done for 50 years agrees with this incredible theory that describes three of the known four known forces in nature. But there's still a lot we don't know. And while we're celebrating this capstone of the standard model, the discovery was just the beginning. CERN was shut down and is, is now being upgraded. What is CERN? CERN. I should say the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Okay. Not CERN itself isn't shut down, but the Large Hadron Collider to be upgraded because it was originally designed to be in an energy about twice the energy that was being used, but they really couldn't get it working initially at that energy. And a much higher luminosity, that means many more particles smashing together. After all, there was only a few hundred events that, that, that we could classify as Higgs particle events. And with a few hundred events, you don't have enough to definitively say what's going on. But the machine is being upgraded and being turned on. And the real mystery of the Higgs is why why is the Higgs there? I mean, it's there, it's part, required of the standard model, but why does the standard model have the properties it has? Why is the weak interaction much weaker than the electromagnetic interaction, but much stronger than gravity? It all depends on the scale at which the Higgs mass is, and we don't know why the Higgs has the mass it is. I mean, all of our evidence earlier was suggesting it should be in this range, but it's a free parameter, and it's a real, it's, a, if, if, it's very perplexing why the forces are separated out the way they are. And we think that the reason for that is that there's a whole bunch of new stuff happening at that same scale, a whole bunch of new particles that we may discover, as well as we still aren't certain if it's the only Higgs in different models that we propose that may explain this paradox. There's more than one Higgs. And so we want to measure the property of the Higgs by not creating just a hundred of them, but millions of them to see, to see what the properties of the Higgs are. But more importantly, look for those new particles and so when the, when the accelerator turns on uh, in 2015, we're going to be waiting because many of us thought we're much more interested, if you wish, in the other stuff than the Higgs because the Higgs was kind of predicted to be part of the standard model and it's exciting to discover it to tell us that we're on the right track. Although, as I've said earlier, right. I would have been much more excited if it wasn't there because I'm much more excited if we're on the wrong track because it means there's something even more exciting to discover. But, but the questions about why it's there all hinge on this unknown other stuff. And so discovery of the Higgs has just opened the door to what we think may be a vast new world, which is like, like opening the, as I, I've said once, like the opening the armoire in, in, um, in uh, uh, that C.S. Lewis story, that Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You discover a whole new wor world in there. When we turn on the Large Hadron Collider in 2015, we could discover a whole new world. And some people have argued that the explanation of all of this relates to the possibility that there are extra dimensions in nature that we haven't seen. I wouldn't bet on it, but there's a large number of people who say, well, maybe there's an extra dimension and we'll actually see particles smash together and disappear into an extra dimension. And that would be wonderful, except it won't happen. So, but again, <laughs> the bottom line is you've got to get that collider, you've got to get those particles hitting each other at these super, super duper speeds, because that's the, all, that's the only way you can the find all, I mean, stuff. if there's any other way, and a cheaper way, we'd do it. But it is amazing, and I, I, I think I've said it before. This is the most complex machine humans have ever built. 26 kilometers around, superconducting. That means tons of liquid helium operating at a temperature colder than... Than, than, than outer space with a vacuum that's more rare than outer space. There are fewer particles in that, in that tube and it has to work over 26 miles with a magnetic field bigger than the magnets we use for MRI or anywhere else here on Earth. Superconducting magnets, if they weren't superconducting, they use more power than you could produce in Europe. But superconducting magnets are, don't use power. So it's just incredibly complicated. It is still amazing that it works. And real quickly now, we only have a minute or so left here. You mentioned all this power that would be needed. Still a lot of power is needed. What about data? Where do you, where do you keep the data? Who looks over this? There must be mountains of this There's stuff. more than mountains of data. That was another big challenge for CERN. Every second when that machine is running, 1,000 terabytes of data oh, goodness. Are, is, is being generated. And, you know, that's the, and so there's more data being generated every second than in all the libraries on Earth. And so the, the, what that means is, and the only way you can handle it is throw most of it out. So you have to have very smart computers that can look immediately and say, that doesn't look interesting, that doesn't look interesting. We're only going to keep, you know, one part in a million, which is still enough to 
pile more, the biggest, the biggest computers, the largest computer network ever being used to analyze everything, just to look for this stuff, which ultimately will tell us why we're here. And thus the Nobel Prize in physics. Exactly. All right. It's great to have you here. Good to see you again. It's we'll look to forward to next month. I'll so see you in the new year. All right. Sounds okay, good. Great. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.